All right. So our second speaker today is Ashley McDonald. She is the project manager of John Valentine, and she is in the progress in the process of uh, preparing a very special project. And I'm actually really keen to hear all about it. Ashley, take it away. Thanks so much, Kat. Thanks for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to talk about this new project today. We're really excited about it. i um, been looking forward to talking about this uh, ever since I arrived to, back to the C-Lab uh, in April of this year. Um, but before I got dive right into this, I kind of wanted to give everyone a little introduction to myself. Um, I'm actually you know, a former student here at the C-Lab, so it's really great to be back. But for those of you that I didn't meet the first time around, which from the looks in the audience, most everybody since I was a student a while back. Um, but I wanted to just give a little bit of background about um, the research that I've done previously in the institutions and labs that I worked on before now. So um, just to start with, I'm from Alabama. I'm North Alabama native, and I went to um, undergraduate at uh, my hometown university of UNA and really got to experience um, the C-Lab in the summers as an undergraduate student and loved it uh, and really got thrown into a great research a project opportunity looking at um, spiny lobster foraging behavior in Belize. And this project really cemented my love for experimental design and uh, asking questions and trying to answer those questions through uh, research. So then I decided I wanted to keep going with this as my career. So I took a um, PhD position um, in Dr. Sabrian's lab. He's a former faculty member here. And I did all of my dissertation work on seagrass ecology and um, seagrass and SAV restoration. And this habitat's actually, you know, very dear, near and dear to my heart. I really learned how much I truly love uh, this type of habitat and how my personal bias might be that it's probably the greatest habitat that ever existed. But that's me. And um, so then after that, I took a new position, um, completely different from anything I'd ever done before. So this is just way out of my wheelhouse. I was a research technician at GCRL with uh, Dr. Robert Leaf, and I got looking into um, Gulf Menhaden population dynamics, very fisheries focused. Um, this is something I've never done before. This might be kind of a thing with me. I kind of tend to take on a lot of projects uh, that I've never had experience working with before. And um, the great thing that I really liked about this project was for one, I had no idea that the pogi fishery was the largest fishery in the Gulf of Mexico, both by volume and um, monetarily. So, and because the species is very important to the, um, to the trophic uh, food web systems in the Gulf of Mexico, understanding their population dynamics in the terms of fisheries and uh, prevent them from overfishing, very important. So it's a really cool project I got to work on. But then after that, I took a research scientist position with Dr. Charlie Martin uh, when he was at University of Florida Nature Coast Biological Station. That's where I was for the past uh, six years or so. And I worked on pretty much any estuarine community of ecology project under the sun. I did it all. Um, I loved it. I've done a ton of stuff while I was over there. We worked on, um, again, estuarine communities, uh, looking at oil spill effects on uh, an entire, you know, community and in individual effects. I did got back into my seagrass SAV ecology again, which I love. And one of the really cool things is I got to head up a project, um, again, doing something I've never done before, which was um, this common snook uh, range expansion into the Suwannee River in Florida. This is a novel population in the area. And I really got to dive into um, looking at things like acoustic telemetry, which again, never had before, but it was a really exciting opportunity and I'm hoping to keep that project actually going while I'm here. So I'll probably continue to be looking into the more, more Snook stuff while I'm up here. Um, so then I took this position in April and uh, working with uh, Dr. Valentine and Charlie. And what was really great about this is that we've already done a lot of work together as um, looking at these oil spill effects on communities and uh, food webs in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, this is all work that I you know, jumped into and didn't really have much history in, but um, John and Charlie really did a great job putting me under, keep me under their wing. And uh, I learned a whole lot along the way. And I think what they learned from me is that I'm either adventurous enough 
or crazy enough to jump into projects I don't really have much experience with, but they know that I like to tackle things and uh, really get a lot of experience um, outside of my comfort zone. So then when they offer me this position to um, work at the I this IMTA demonstration project, which is aquaculture, again, nothing I've ever done before, but uh, it was very exciting and I was very much looking forward to jumping into it. Um, so this is the project that I'll be talking with you about today, but I um, also wanted to let you know that I also like to do a little bit of marine ecology projects on the side. So uh, my office is in the back. If y'all ever want to come talk about um, any projects or anything, just uh, hit me up. I love chatting about stuff and uh, be happy to. But now to get to the main focus of the story today. Um, so this is uh, regarding a demonstration project of an integrated multi-tropic aquaculture or IMTA system in the Northern Gulf of Mexico. And my ultimate plan for this talk was just kind of help answer the question for everybody of why are we doing offshore aquaculture in Alabama? Who is asking for this? You know, where is this coming from? And why all of a sudden? So um, to sort of help answer that question, um, kind of give like an overall like five mile high view of the current state of global fisheries and aquaculture production. And um, so what we can say with uh, looking at all of this is basically that aquaculture and fisheries feed and employ populations worldwide. Um, this statement is based on a recent report from the Food and Agricultural Organization of the UN, which found that in 2022, a record amount of nearly 200 million tons of biomass was produced from these natural resource sectors. And uh, this biomass was overwhelmingly from animal products, but there is an increasing amount of uh, owl species products being produced. And nearly 90% of that production went directly to human consumption. So it's definitely feeding a lot of people. Um, also, um, this production is a huge benefit to low and middle income nations um, as the export of aquatic animal products was around $45 billion in 2022. Um, but this was also greater than all other agricultural products combined. So you can imagine the uh, incentive for lower economic nations to sort of really put a lot of energy into increasing their um, aquatic animal output. But in addition to that, uh, nearly 62 million people are employed in the fisheries and aquaculture production sector. And that's just the directly related portions of aquaculture production and fisheries production. That doesn't even include the um, indirectly related sectors like uh, seafood markets and processing. And this was just something I found interesting while doing this research. Um, there's a pretty strict gender-based disparity amongst the sectors when it comes to the um, people that actually go out and harvest or grow out um, the seafood versus the people that are more in terms of um, supportive or processing roles. And the harvesters are predominantly men and the uh, supporters and the processing sectors are predominantly women. Doesn't really necessarily have anything to do with my talk today, just kind of a very interesting uh, statistic to share with everybody. So why are fisheries and aquaculture products being produced at record levels? Well, that's because demand for them is at an all-time high. Um, the FAO also found that aquatic protein consumption has increased at a rate twice the annual population growth rate since 1961 to current times. Um, you can see like the U.S. in the green line here. We're way up there in terms of um, consumption and demand. And this rise in demand has had a direct negative impact on global fisheries, such that the number of sustainably fish stocks globally has declined to only around 62%. Uh, and this decline is uh, projected to continue as the demand continues to increase. And so it's for this reason that many international government agencies like the UN have stated that aquaculture is the future for sourcing marine products. Um, in fact, aquaculture surpassed wild harvest as the primary source of marine products for the first time in 2022, with the majority of that production going towards human consumption. So that brings us to the question of uh, what is the domestic demand for aquaculture? Um, nationally, the U.S. contributes less than 0.5% of global aquaculture production, but as the excuse me, second largest consumer, we import up to 85% of our aquatic products. 
Um, this is despite the fact that a 20 year old study determined that as little as 500 square kilometer area of open water could produce up to 600,000 megatons of seafood annually. Uh, this is in concert with an increasing national market demand for domestically produced sustainable seafood. Regionally in the Northern Gulf of Mexico, um, aquaculture efforts produce more shellfish than anywhere else, uh, any other region in the US. Um, however, there are currently no offshore fin fish operations in place. But there are two demonstration projects and one commercial scale project um, that are currently in the permitting stage waiting for approval with one of those dem demo projects being our own. And then locally in state waters, uh, very fine point view, uh, only oyster aquaculture is taking place. Um, but this aquaculture is rapidly expanding into several successful ventures such as Murder Point Oysters, which is where this photo is from. Uh, but there's also locally on the island, um, Isle of Dauphine Oyster Company. And um, the desire, uh, the number of these ventures is really growing rapidly. And I'm sure that has a lot to do with the Auburn Shellfish Lab and aquaculture that they do there at, um, being so local. So it's been um, very much supported in this area. However, there is a local desire for um, a greater diversity in the types of local products that are available available in markets. And um, that desire is really uh, centered around fin fish. People want to see fin fish products. So the question is, if there's so much demand for aquaculture products and there are plenty of opportunities to expand our domestic sector, then what is actually holding back sustainable offshore fishies, fisheries aquaculture? Well, there are several issues that have been attributed to um, the minimal offshore aquaculture expansion in the US, with the foremost issue really being unclear regulatory policies that have led to confusion amongst agencies when attempting to um, permit these operations. And I will definitely get into that in just a minute, so let's put a pin in it. Um, but there's also a lack of societal acceptance in a lot of areas for offshore finfish aquaculture that has somewhat been exacerbated by uh, propagation of misinformation. However, there's also been a few bad faith actors that have given the entire sector a bad name and just put, put a bad taste in people's mouths about the whole operation. However, there are also some legitimate concerns um, over harmful environmental impacts that are very understandable um, that provide some pushback for those that are looking to start a new operation. And so the question that I hope to answer somewhat with this talk today is um, how the Alabama IMTA project got started and how this project is unique in our attempt to address these issues. So to start building offshore aquaculture production in the US, several federal agencies had to get with a subcommittee on aquaculture in 2011 to develop a plan um, to make the US a world leader in developing, demonstrating, and employing innovative and sustainable aquaculture. And then in 2020, an executive order was passed that intended to provide federal support for the expansion of aquaculture in federal and state waters. However, the issue of regulatory confusion is still a big burden in the Gulf of Mexico, and it has severely constrained offshore aquaculture expansion in the region. Um, this is because a recent lawsuit uh, actually revoked NOAA's intended policy that was um, their attempt to manage and lead all permitting requirements for U.S. aquaculture, um, meaning that once that got revoked, there was no clear pathway forward for individuals looking to kickstart an operation in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, luckily for us, the NOAA Fisheries Southeast Regional Office is um, part of a strategic plan to enhance regulatory efficiency in aquaculture which means that they're working directly with um, applicants like us to achieve permitting approval from all the essential federal and state agencies that require it. So following the formation of permitting assistance within NOAA, um, congressional funding was earmarked by Alabama legislators to align with the strategic plan set by the NOAA Aquaculture Program, which is made up of members from these three individual NOAA divisions. Um, and the intention of, intention of this funding was to explore the potential for small-scale, individual-based aquaculture system in Alabama state waters. Um, and it was also intended as a cooperative by the NOAA Aquaculture Program to fund a demonstration project. 
that also incorporated members of the local community. Um, so this project is a collaborative effort between NOAA Aquaculture Program and the Gulf States Marine Fisheries Commission. And they wanted to fund a group of institutions, including DIZL, um, USM Stad Cochran Marine Aquaculture Center, the University of New Hampshire, and the Sea Grant programs from Mississippi, Alabama, and New Hampshire. And so the idea for this project is to focus on a low impact form of sustainable aquaculture techniques uh, called integrated multi-trophic aquaculture or IMTA. Um, and it's a technique that involves raising multiple aquatic species from different trophic levels together in close proximity. Um, and so a typical IMTA grow out plan consists of uh, fed species. There's generally a fin fish, which then gets fed um, with uh, whatever food uh, pellets or whatever you have um, for them, which is what provides generally the, uh, the pollution in a lot of cases that a lot of people are concerned with. And then, but in addition to fin fish, you're also growing a suspension or deposit feeding species, such as an echinoderm or bivalves that help to remove particulate waste from leftovers from the fed species. Um, and then you finally also grow a primary producing uh, nutrient uptake species. And so the goal of IMTA is to improve efficiency, reduce waste, and provide ecosystem services by growing out these secondary species that also serve as a form of secondary income for the farmers, and um, also to minimize introduction of particulate and dissolved pollution to the local ecosystem. And so the plan to implement an IMTA demonstration project in our area has four primary goals. Goal one is to demonstrate the effectiveness of sustainable and low impact aquaculture in Alabama state waters using indigenous species with high local market demand. Uh, goal two is to train local commercial fishers and independent farmers on the IMTA system techniques, permitting requirements, and reduction of aquaculture impact on local ecosystems. Our third goal is to conduct adequate monitoring of the system to determine environmental influence on the surrounding habitats. And finally, our fourth goal is to complete two grow-out seasons with a harvest starting in uh, fall 2025. And so this is a video of the IMTA system that is currently in uh, New Hampshire. Um, so this was our IMTA system was designed based on this design. Um, this is what is they are calling uh, an aquafort. And it's been in operation off the coast of Portsmouth for the past few years. Um, it's just a floating platform design with two net pin bays for finfish and lots of attachment points uh, to hang baskets for the secondary product species. Um, the platform itself is around 50 feet by 30 feet and the entire footprint of the aquafort including mooring lines and anchor, um, is less than half an acre. So the main difference in the Alabama aquifort is that instead of um, growing the um, what they had, which was steelhead trout, blue mussels, and sugar kelp, we're going to be growing out uh, red drum, eastern oysters, and gracilaria, graceful red feed. So this is a great video of actually, this is a steelhead trout growing in the system. Um, very fat and happy, beautiful fish, very delicious. It was awesome. Great trip I had up there. Um, so, but the decision to use redfish as our targeted finfish species is based on several factors, um, including that it's a native species that grows optimally in coastal Alabama waters. Uh, it's also listed as having very high potential for commercial growth in the U.S. Uh, redfish is also in high demand as a desirable high-end seafood product although it is currently primarily grown for stock enhancement purposes. Uh, our project is intending to rear redfish fry at the um, USM TC Mac facility. Um, and then those fry will then be stocked offshore into the IMTA system for grow out, in which our goal is to harvest around 30,000 pounds of redfish during each grow out season, which will occur from November to May uh, to avoid hurricane season as best we can, that's the idea. But the participants that we recruit for this project from the local community will participate in this harvest period. And then they will also take whatever is harvested to market for sale for themselves. So for our bivalve, um, Eastern oysters are the ideal particulate suspension feeder species for this project as like redfish, 
They are a native species that grows optimally in coastal Alabama waters. They also have very high demand in our markets and are currently the only aquaculture species in state coastal waters. Our project will rear around 100,000 triploid spat at the TCMAC facility, which will then be stocked into these SEPA baskets that are shown in this photo. And those baskets will be suspended from the IMTA platform for off-bottom uh, oyster aquaculture. And fortunately, the saddest news I have to present today is that none of these oysters are destined for consumption. The water around the IMTA has not been rated and is not monitored for uh, or approved for uh, shellfish harvest. So because of that, these oysters will not be wasted. They will go for research and restoration purposes, but yeah, no oyster parties. And then finally, we'll be using uh, graceful redweed as, as a grassalaria species um, because it also is native and grows optimally in coastal Alabama waters. Um, however, there's not much yet understood about its market demand, but we do know that there is growing potential for this species in the U.S. Um, for the market for it, since it's a very popular aquaculture species currently in China, who uses it for animal feed and for agar extract extraction. Uh, our project is going to take around two and a half kilos that have been grown at the TCMAC facility, and then those will get stocked in baskets to be suspended from the IMTA platform with the oysters. And so the mooring location of the IMTA system was determined after a very detailed analysis by NOAA NCCOS, who based their siting recommendations on rigorous criteria, including engineering requirements for the system and avoidance of numerous natural, cultural, and industrial resources. So basically trying to find an area where it's not going to be in the way of anything, it's nowhere near any um, channels, and it's not going to be um, have an influence on any habitats um, that are known like designated fish habitats or protected habitats. So the final selected site is approximately three kilometers south of the Fort Morgan Peninsula at a fair distance from any commercial shipping lane. And a baseline survey was conducted at the selected site um, by the Hydrographic Science Research Center of USM who conducted side scan sonar relays to determine if there were any notable benefits, uh, or sorry, any notable benthic habitats at the site that may preclude selection of this site due to habitat protection restrictions. Um, these surveys determined the depth at the site to be between 10 and 11 meters, with the benthos comprising of uniform hard packed sand without vertical relief and no evidence of any geological features such as hard bottom habitat. This site is ideal for limiting aquaculture effects on surrounding habitats, and the small footprint of the aquafort system is similarly ideal for siting in this area. But just to be sure, you know, we want to make sure that we're capturing anything that could potentially, you know, come off of the IMTA that may have an effect on the uh, surrounding ecosystem. So we um, will be conducting extensive environmental monitoring of the area surrounding the IMTA and at comparable reference sites. Um, these monitoring efforts will be conducted prior to deployment of the IMTA system. Um, during deployment, so during that grow out season while the IMTA is out there, uh, I probably didn't mention this earlier, but the IMTA will only be more during the grow out season. Once the season's over, it's coming back to land and then we'll take it back out the next year. So um, we'll be sampling while the IMT is out there, we'll be sampling around it. And then after the project is done and we're not gonna be deploying it again, we'll go back and sample one more time. And these samples are gonna be three times per, se per season. So it's gonna be a fall, a winter, and a spring sampling event. And so just to summarize um, the project and where we're at right now, um, this demonstration project is really just getting uh, kicking off now after spending quite a bit of time in the red tape zone. We've gotten through some serious milestones and things are really beginning to happen behind the scenes. So although we're still in the permitting stage, technically, uh, we're waiting on a few agencies and some paperwork to be finalized, we have been approved to begin pre-deployment sampling this fall. Uh, we are also starting to work on recruiting participants from the local fisheries and oyster aquaculture community to train on the IMTA, uh, which is definitely a very important component of the demonstration aspect of this project. And if everything goes 
as according to plan. That's the plans that we have in this moment. We hope to begin construction on the Aquafort platform next summer and to deploy the Aquafort offshore at the um, Aquafort site in fall of 2025.